So, good evening from Tbilisi. I'm uh, Dimitri Skidishvili, uh, President of the Georgian Progressive Forum, and I welcome you on Carnegie Europe's event. Can Georgia overcome its political divide? So, I'm uh, the moderating today's discussion, and I hope very much uh, on fruitful discussion on the about mentioned um, uh, issue. So, today's panel is culmination of the project the Future of Europe, which was run jointly by the um, uh, Carnegie Europe and Levan Miguel as a foundation and supported by Finnish Minister of Foreign Affairs and the government office of the Swedish Sweden. So, um, in the framework of the, you know, the project, Artur Gegeshidze and uh, Thomas Deval developed the analytical paper which seeks to identify special characters and of the polarization in Georgia's root causes and, uh, to, uh, and to explain how political culture clashes are Link. So today's we discussion is uh, has a very central questions like what are the uh, specifics of polarization in Georgia and how can country overcome its political divide. So I'm delighted to introduce our speakers today: Arsul Gegeshidze, Executive Director of Levan Mikhailov Foundation, former Ambassador of Georgia to the United States, and uh, with a long uh, experience of working in academic organization and also spending uh, years in uh, state offices, uh, serving as a chief policy uh, advisor of the president of the Georgia. Thomas Deval, well known in Carnegie, uh, so he's a senior fellow of Carnegie Europe and specializing in Eastern Europe and the South of Caucasus, so special expertise on the South of Caucasus and the Georgia, and uh, he's out of numerous publications on this street. Uh, Jennifer McCoy is a political uh, science professor of the Georgia State University, the, the United States, not the country Georgia, of, of course. She's also a non-resident scholar of Carnegie Endowment of, for International Peace and is a currently visiting research researcher at the Central European University's Democracy Institute in Budapest. So she's, uh, you know, She has produced two volumes of collaborative work on the political polarization and uh, it's a uh, thread on democracy globally. She's working with uh, Murat Sommer uh, on a book uh, on overcoming uh, pernicious polarization and protecting democracy. So, uh, so uh, I would like to start with Archil about the historical perspective. So in, in your uh, analytical paper, you um, describe quite perfectly the historical roots and developments on the modern history of Georgia and the, Different period, the different cycles of the political uh, polarization. So, um, um, coming back to the nowadays, so what are the weaknesses? Uh, what what we all are witnessing? How is this something uh, uh, unique in the modern history of Georgia, or has it already taken place uh, place uh, in in the past? Thank you, uh, Dimitri. Thank you, everybody. Hello. Uh, before uh, answering your question, uh, l l let me uh, l let me clarify uh, uh, the concept of polarization as we understand it. Uh, Georgia is a country with uh, multiple lines of uh, internal division. In Georgian society at large, there are diverging perceptions of recent history since independence. And also there are strong, strongly diverging views about what the status of ethnic Georgians, the ethnic language, Georgian language, and the Georgian Orthodox Church should be in national life. Georgia experiences societal clashes as it struggles to find a balance between traditional values and its aspiration to be a modern society that is part of the European community of nations, encouraging diversity and minority rights including sexual minority rights. And together, these divisions can be grouped under the category of social polarization. At the same time, as you said, uh, there's a sharp, I mean, it's, it's a political struggle uh, going on in Georgia um, between two largest uh, political parties, the Georgian Dream and the United National Movement, which at times leads the process into a, an acute political crisis, including paralyzing the work of the parliament. That is why the developments in Georgia over the past couple of years has attracted so much attention. And we call this split in the political elite, political polarization. Both of these types of polarization have their own causes, but it is clear that there are certain interrelationship. Uh, the Future of Georgia project has tried to delve uh, into these topics and produced interesting publications in this 
uh, su subject matters in three languages, Georgian, English, and Russian, and they are available online on the websites of Carnegie Europe and the Levin Michelisi Foundation, as well as Jam News. So now let, uh, let me come back to your uh, question. Uh, one of the observations coming from the project is that uh, indeed, the current political polarization is not a phenomenon uh, in Georgia um, that is very unique in its modern history. It has a precedent. Uh, the roots of Georgia's current state of deep pol uh, political rivalry arguably lie in splits within the pro-independence national movement at the end of the 1980s, in the late years of the Soviet Union. Uh, since then, strong charismatic leaders and their rivalries have shaped political life in Georgia, uh, but it, it does not make uh, Georgia uh, unique because it, Georgia shares these features uh, with some other countries. But still, uh, we, we will be discussing um, uh, Georgia's case in more detail. So first, uh, the first uh, individual, uh, this charismatic individual in Georgia's modern history, uh, with whom uh, I think uh, started uh, this political uh, standoff and confrontation uh, was the first president, Zviad Gamsa uh, He was a highly polarizing figure, and uh, his authority rose uh, as the previous regime, communist regime, was discredited by the tragic events of April 9 of 1989, when the Soviet military brutally suppressed a peaceful demonstration in Tbilisi, whereby 20 people, mostly women, were killed. Uh, Gamsakhurdi and his associates uh, from the National Liberation Movement created the National Forum at that time to, uh, and began to promote the idea of Georgia's independence, which was quickly picked up by the entire public. However, despite this consensus on the strategic goal, uh, a, a disagreement arose uh, within this forum over tactics, how to defeat the communists. One camp led by Gamsa Khurdia argued that the uh, communists should be defeated in the Georgia-wide elections called in 1990 by the old, this uh, communist leadership. While the second camp advocated for a boycott of the Soviet elections and the creation of an alternative authority, the National Congress. The leaders of the second camp, unfortunately, also turned out to be quite polarizing figures. Ultimately, this, uh, uh, this split uh, led to the collapse of the forum. However, and very sadly, after Gamsa Khurdia and his supporters single-handedly defeated the communists in, in those elections, the second half camp did not reconcile with Gamsa Khurdia's success and engaged uh, with him in a power struggle throughout his what turned out to be later a short-lived presidency. Gradually, the confrontation took on a violent character, and in the end, as a result of a military putsch, the Gamsakhurdia regime was overthrown. These events generated extreme political polarization in Georgia, leading to a, a civil war. The scars of this confrontation, of this civil war, are still visible and continue to influence public sentiment. A survey conducted specifically for the, um, the Future of Georgia project uh, showed that 76% of the respondents disapproved the overthrow of Gamsa Khurdia in 1992. So Georgia is still living with the legacy of this period now. Some of the factors that uh, undermined the national movement then are still prevalent in Georgian politics today. Mm, and the main similarity uh, between the current situation in Georgia and the period of uh, the early 90s is that we still Unfortunately, they do not know how to properly manage this political polarization. So that would be my answer to the question whether or not political polarization um, uh, has a precedent uh, in Georgia's modern history. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, the, the second question comes from 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 here, just what you said. So of course we have the different periods of the development of the different periods of the polarization, but currently what we see that the political life is somehow disconnected from the political polarization. So society is not so much connected to the people are not following the political you know, political leaders and stakeholders, let's say. So they are a bit quite hate, they are quite, quite um, tired of this uh, hate speech in the traditional media, on this mainstream media, and the social media as well. So people are disconnected. So 
what are the um, probably the cost of the current uh, political polarization uh, and, and, and what made it cost and what will be the consequences in the long run or midterm run so uh yes the negative uh, consequences of polarization are felt in many aspects of everyday life for nearly two years now georgians have experienced almost permanent political tension uh, for example, uh, as there is the parliament has not functioned properly for, for some time, being boycotted by the opposition. And also the um, judiciary has been in crisis over appointment of top judges and so and so forth. The media uh, also polarized, is saturated with uh, uh, content ex exclusively covering the vicissitudes uh, of the political struggle. Uh, the purpose of which is to determine uh, in who will take uh, which seat in parliament or government. government. Uh, the uh, almost chronic political polarization and permanent crisis plunges the population into apathy and demotivates them from participating in politics. Uh, as a result, the participatory process and faith uh, in democratic institutions suffer. In addition, the sharp nature of the struggle for power refrains the uh, authorities from depoliticizing the law enforcement institutions, for example, and ending their, uh, and their use uh, for party interests. Meanwhile, the uh, pressing problems of uh, public policy, such as the socioeconomic well-being uh, of the population, as well as the pandemic uh, or the environment, uh, are neglected. And uh, another uh, issue that uh, receives too little attention uh, in the rapid alienation of the population uh, on both sides uh, of the dividing line of Abkhazia and uh, South Ossetia. Um, this is also a problem which, uh, unfortunately, is overlooked uh, against the background of this political struggle. Um, Last but not least, for example, is the cost associated with the Georgia's deteriorating international image. Georgia is no longer seen as a front runner reformer in the Eastern Partnership region. And as the government prepares to apply for EU membership in 2024, uh, this is particularly worrisome. So these are some of the costs, uh, uh, immediate costs and uh, longer run uh, long to, I mean, uh, in the long run, uh, some consequences, uh, which, uh, which, 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 which Georgia uh, has to pay uh, or go through unless uh, we learn and manage and be are able to manage uh, this political polarization properly. Uh, yes, and one final question. Uh, uh, so you just described the uh, consequences and uh, cost what Georgia should pay, and I, as I assume that most of the politicians, at least, they want to show that they understand this problem. At least, uh, what was initiated by Madam President just recently to try to to reconcile the cross political process and to escalate the polarized uh, the political system. At least, most of the stakeholders participated. That no one, almost no one, refused to participate in this. Uh, meetings in the first stage of the introduction of the from the president at the same time we had the experience when uh, president of the european union uh, brought all the political parties together and uh, uh, so they agreed on, on something but from one side of the main political uh, actors and then next another important political actors they complicate this story so Mm, but it, anyway, the European Parliament proposed uh, the uh, Jean Monnet dialogue process, which was not so much, so, so far uh, launched, uh, but at least uh, it's is on, so, on the table. So, how do you think uh, all these process? Do they complement each other? How do you think from uh, from now this perspective? Does, does it have the potential to to find some kind of solution and depolarize the Georgian political society? So, yeah, thank you for this question. Yes, indeed, today we have uh, two different processes uh, aimed at addressing existing divisions in Georgia. Um, the first is uh, what you mentioned, Madam President's initiative to introduce an uh, inclusive process, a kind of a national conversation involving all of society to find a way uh, to achieve a shared understanding of uh, recent history to help healing the pains and uh, move forward. 
She has already hosted a series of events and spoke on several occasions on this uh, subject. Uh, on the whole, uh, uh, yeah, you're right, the society and most of the political uh, elite, uh, political class, uh, positively received the very idea of uh, a national dialogue because everyone understands how high the costs of the current political confrontation uh, are. However, uh, it remains unclear how exactly this process should take place, this, this process of uh, national dialogue. It is only known that the, in addition to dialogue in various thematic groups, it is planned to hold uh, an international conference or, or conduct a nationwide survey uh, or uh, conduct some kind of research. It looks like it's going to be a kind of quite a long process. And here the skeptics uh, are wondering to what extent uh, the personality of the president given the protests of opposition associated with her election, can be the driving force behind the reconciliation process. And related to this is another question uh, about the continuity of this process, because it is unlikely that the process of this dialogue will be completed before the next uh, presidential election. Uh, in general, the coming months and years will show how the process will start and how much the president's initial enthusiasm will be enough to ensure sustainability of the process. In any case, uh, it should be noted that the idea itself is quite noble because Georgia has long been in need of a societal consensus on national priority issues. As for the second process uh, which you mentioned, uh, it's not about a dialogue, but uh, the will and the ability of government to take action. It is aimed at a more short-term perspective and applies to reduce the political tension in the country through reforming democratic institutions. This is a process that began almost a year ago in the form of a high-level intervention by the EU, uh, EU uh, presidency, I mean, European Commission's European Council president, Mr. Charles Michel, backed by, by the United States. Due to the enormous diplomatic efforts uh, of uh, uh, President Michel, uh, representatives of most political parties signed an agreement ending the opposition's parliamentary boycott and uh, paving the way for further electoral and judicial reforms. Uh, the agreement soon, uh, soon uh, fell victim to the country's political polarization. However, the uh, United National Movement uh, did not sign the document and then Georgian Dream withdrew from the agreement on the grounds that its main uh, adversary had not supported it. While the Georgian dream has committed itself to reform uh, to, to reforms without formally participating in the agreement, the Western mediators uh, did not approve for this move. Um, Georgia now faces three years before the next scheduled parliamentary elections due in 2024, which are likely to be characterized by more tension and confrontation. Ideally, this period uh, should be used uh, uh, to build public confidence in the political institutions, primarily the electoral and judicial systems, uh, and uh, uh, complete depoliticization, depoliticization of institutions, uh, especially law enforcement is highly needed here. Yet um, the vicious circle of political polarization may not allow the main actors to change the dynamics. That's my uh, guess. The ongoing crisis gives uh, um, uh, extra res responsibilities to the European Union and the general you know, to the Western governments, which uh, have been acting as uh, de facto checks and balances on Georgia for the past two decades. The experience of the uh, Western mediation, uh, this, uh, this recent mediation is very instructive as it shows that the transformative power of the programs to integrate Georgia into the European Union and Euro Atlantic structures uh, possibly uh, is insufficient. I think that the tougher conditionality and stronger application, on the other hand, of the more for more principle uh, are re required. Uh, with the EU asking Georgia to deliver more on its commitments to uh, democ democracy before it receives assistance, but for its part, the EU should not be late in providing benefits to Georgia uh, when justified. And uh, the history of successful European integration shows that granting uh, the pro uh, prospect of EU membership uh, is a powerful incentive for aspirant countries like Georgia to adhere to democratic reforms. Thank you. Yes, 
absolutely agree that maybe in, uh, financial or other uh, instruments are not motivating the political uh, actors as much as the prospect of joining the, the European Union because it is one of the highest approval issue in the Georgian society and everyone wants to, to benefit. Every politician wants to benefit from this uh, from this uh, proposal. So I think that could be one of the main main instruments. But how can international organization, international community? Uh, yes, there is a, a, a little bit of lack of reciprocity on the part of uh, uh, European Union sometimes, and that's that's uh, how how we see this process from here. Yeah. So I now want to to move to to, to, to another speaker. The Tom uh, has, as I mentioned, has a great experience of observing and studying and analyzing the situation in the region from the regional perspective. Uh, so and uh, here probably uh, Georgia is again it's not unique. Every country in the region, especially in the in the eastern partnership country or the South Caucasus, has a uh, different degree, a different level of the polarization. Except maybe Azerbaijan, who is a different story because of this uh, one-party domination and uh, less the democratic uh, developments. I would say. Uh, but uh, Armenia and uh, Ukraine and maybe Moldova as well have the different, yeah. quite interesting stories of development. Each of them, and mm -hmm. different content of the of the, the dispute issues before be, between the sides. But still, uh, Armenia faced uh, the some polarization uh, and still faced, and Ukraine now. I think we've lost. Have we lost? Sorry. Lost you, Dimitri. So, and uh, Ukraine and uh, maybe Moldova, Moldova uh, had uh, for right. some time a very hard uh, confrontation between oh. the political actors and now it's more or less uh, sold, uh, at least there's a different mm. uh, level of uh, polarization. So, maybe uh, how we can distinguish the Georgian case right. from, from the regional Sure. Case? Well, I mean, I think this is a really important issue, uh, Dimitri. I mean, the first thing, as, as Jennifer can testify, polarization if a country has polarization, there, there's a positive there that it, it shows that there is debate, there is some kind of democratic uh, discourse in the country, there is the ability to disagree, which is, is not true in Russia, it's not cu currently true in Belarus, not not mainly true in, in, in Azerbaijan, for example. Um, and um, so the, the countries that you've named, Eastern Partnership countries, are the more uh, democratic ones, where there is indeed this, this polarization. Um, um, we're not talking about one-party uh, domination, uh, although of course Georgian Dream is quite is quite a powerful uh, ruling party now in Georgia. Um, in in the Georgian case, I guess the polarization um, takes place because United National Movement kind of occupies the whole opposition space, um, and and this is 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 a particularly difficult issue. So what what's different about Georgian uh, Georgia's polarization? Well, I think it's particularly top down. It's elite uh, driven. I very much like the phrase of Ilya Rubanis, who described Georgian politics more than a decade ago. He described it as pluralistic feudalism, in which um, um, a, a party a party has a has a, a leader, a charismatic leader, um, and who shapes uh, that party, and then they can take over, and the country completely changes when there's a change of power, as we've seen under all Georgia's post uh, independence leaders. Um, so it's particularly elite driven and, and top down. Um, the, there's, there's been in, in our survey and, and in other um, other reports, you can see that on policy issues, particularly on socio-economic policies, there's not much to divide the two main parties. On geopolitics, they have some differences about how to treat Russia, but they still share the same common uh, Euro-Atlantic uh, aspiration. They believe that Europe that, that Georgia has a European destiny. They share this idea of a kind of Georgian national uh, product. So that's one thing um, which is very striking is, is, is that it's a very much an elite driven process. I think the other thing is um, worth mentioning in the Georgian case, and this is also driven by the media, is the political language is particularly angry and violent. Um, Stephen Jones has written about this and there's a kind of paradox that it's both Soviet, the language of enemies, enemies of the people, uh, traitors and so on. And it's also kind of anti-Soviet in the sense that it's also applied um, to people, that, um, particularly with regard to Russia, that they are Russian agents and so on. So that, so that this, I think, builds on a kind of Georgian historical tradition of being a small country under siege, whereby you identify 
um, fellow Georgians as being possible fifth colonists and traitors. And this, this I think, is a very unhealthy element of the political discourse because I think it, it, it kind of encourages um, rather a, a patriotic discourse, which I think also doesn't help Georgia move forward when it comes to its foreign relations, when it comes to its um, minorities. So, so there, those are two things that I would single out uh, in particular. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I would add that these two main political actors are somehow benefiting and are typically fueling this confrontation because both of them are getting more votes in, in uh, terms of the, the campaign is polarized. So the more votes go to the two centers, two polls, and then the smaller parties are not um, showing up and not, uh, I'll say, uh, not not uh, not gaining the, any, anything. There. So, but here's an, another question. So, meaning uh, that um, uh, why the uh, middle ground was not uh, successful, right. especially in these elections. Uh, even though we had quite uh, prominent figures participating in the political process, like former prime minister who used to be the, one of the most popular person right. uh, in, in the ruling party, or young charismatic leader like Anna Dolita, who was quite successful, but still not making any sense. And in, in, in addition to, to be as a, presented as a party, they tried to, at least uh, verbally, they tried to change the political discourses to uh, political agenda, but not successful, because anyway, the, we, we saw that yeah. the campaign was quite right. polarized. So what, what I, I think I think this is a really important question as to why does the middle ground, which I think most Georgians support, why does a third force uh, never do well in Georgian elections? Uh, and you've named figures like uh, Georgi Gakharia, who I think had a very high rating as prime minister. As soon as he went and left the government, um, he failed to do well. Uh, you mentioned Anna Dolidze. Um, you one could go back and mention David Usabashvili or Irakli Alessania, quite um, strong political figures who again failed to make a breakthrough. So what's what's going on here? Um, and, and also in, in our report with our chill, we, we, we cite a poll from CRRC, I think it's NDI, which when asked which party is closest to you, this is July 2021, 51% of respondents answered no party. Um, only 18% named Georgian Dream and 6% UNM. And yet when you come to an election, the voters turn out for those two parties. So what's going on here? Um, well, obviously, the media is one factor, the fact that the media um, supports, um, basically doesn't support the middle ground, um, either one party or another. So these two parties, parties dominate the kind of public discourse. That's one factor. Um, I think campaign finance is another issue. These two um, parties are much better financed and have much stronger roots uh, in, in, in the region. Um, so that's that. That's I think another aspect. But there's obviously, and I think you're hinting at this, Dimitri, an element of collusion here that both it suits both of these parties. I think to be in this kind of battle and to eliminate a third force like uh, Gakhari. I think Gakhari was attacked in the last elections by both of these two main parties, and we've seen um, them both wanting to raise the threshold for entry into parliament, uh, a higher percentage. Um, we've seen them both, um, I think, agreeing um, tacitly that the, that the public prosecutor should be under control of the government. So there is, I think, unfortunately, an element of, of collusion here, which is alienating a Georgian society, who, who the majority of whom clearly um, want to see alternatives. Thank you very much. Uh, before I go to our next speaker, I would like to, you know, to remind our audience that they could ask the question through... Uh, on the YouTube channel or Twitter, and uh, then I will try to, to void them up and give to, 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 to our speaker. So now I'm moving to, to another speaker, and now uh, Jennifer. Uh, yeah. Let's look on this issue on the broader than the region. So what about the global perspective? Uh, what is, uh, uh, how we can compare the Georgian case with other, other regions in uh, other countries? Could you just elaborate on that? Yeah, thank you, Dimitri. Um, well, first of all, Georgia is part of a global trend. We see rising polarization of this sort uh, in all regions of the world, except for Oceania, that is Australia and New Zealand are, are less, but all other parts of the world. And the sources differ of the polarization, 
But the logic is the same that, and it can entrap societies when it becomes pernicious. And that's especially when partisan identities become social identities. So you talked about how there's very little um, partisan, uh, the voters don't identify with the parties to a large degree, yet when they vote, they're still voting for a party. And the report talks about the loyalty, particularly to leaders that voters have. But another important source might be something that's similar to say a country like Hungary, and that is public employment. And so then people keep voting for the party that they think can give them public employment when that becomes a very large source um, of jobs. Um, but another uh, source that's becoming important around the world that Georgia shares as well is that cultural differences are now more prevalent than the economic ideological divides that we saw in the past, particularly in, in, in Western countries and Western Europe, for example. And so we see this, um, the cultural differences, which can be, you know, be how much do you, uh, there's a lot of divides in countries over focusing on uh, how you uh, define the national identity and the national culture and how nationalistic are we going to be and who will be a citizen and so which ethnicities, what language, what religion. And then on the other hand, how much do we align with other countries? How much do we want to integrate with the West versus Russia, for example? So these kinds of differences are very prevalent around the world in kind of defining contemporary polarization. Now, another um, thing we often see is that polarization emerges around a single polarizing leader or figure and who creates a lot of loyalty. So we've seen this in countries like Venezuela with Hugo Chavez. So the polarization became, are you pro-Chavez or anti-Chavez? Now, in George's case, um, we have two polarizing figures and parties who have created this top-down party polarization that Tom and Archil have talked about in the report. And they seem to be almost inventing differences. They have to create identities for their parties because there's so little ideological difference uh, between them. And that may be more similar to a country like Bangladesh, where the parties polarized around, um, would, do they want is the national identity gonna focus more on religion or more on language? Uh, is it more Bengali or is it more Muslim as the kind of first defining character? Um, or the ties to the West, as I mentioned, like Hungary, is it going to be really pro-Europe or really focused on nationalism, national Hungarians defined as Christian, ethnically, language speaking Hungarians? And so we see that in Georgia, what I understand from reading the report, I'm not a Georgia expert, I will say but is that it seems to be almost uh, inventing these different identities to create this. That, and so it's a form of very much elite competition here and elite polarization. Now, one other thing I wanna point out, and that is that I think that Georgia is suffering from the case of many polarized democracies today that comes from a structural problem of weak institutions and weak commitment to democratic norms. And so we see this in uh, some countries in Latin America, in South and Southeast Asia, in other post-communist countries. And so this is a long-term problem. This is a larger problem, but it can be, uh, it can give rise to this type of polarization that makes it very difficult to combat. And so we see the consequences um, and a very common pattern uh, that we've seen, that we've just heard about is happening in Georgia as well. First, there are general distrust in institutions, dissatisfaction with democracy, withdrawal from politics. That's a common consequence of this kind of polarization. We either see government dysfunction if governments become paralyzed between and polarized between two, two uh, parties and so, no decisions can be made, or 
uh, the common pattern, and I think this is what seems to be happening in Georgia, is that one party eventually becomes hegemonic. If they are able to entrench advantages for themselves, such as an electoral system, or as we've heard, you know, campaign finance, uh, patronage, jobs, with the use of state resources, if they entrench the advantages for themselves because they have a supermajority in a parliament, then it becomes then they can easily become hegemonic, and and then we don't have competition anymore. And so, you know, one of my questions is: Are we at that point? One of my questions for the other panelists: Are we at that point uh, for Georgia? Yeah. So thank you very much. Um, and uh, the maybe last question from my side. Um, how to end this polarization? Not speaking about the, the scenario which exists in the authoritarian country, but in a democratic way. What are the what are the how we can reduce or manage the polarization? In, in maybe some tips for Georgia. Yeah, one of the things we found in looking at polarization and depolarization around the world is that in many cases it, it's it's often uh, in many countries it turns out to be cyclical so that a depolarizing episode may be only temporary. In other cases, and this is what we see when we look at measurements of polarization in Georgia, countries have to learn to manage a long-standing, fairly high level of polarization. So managing it is another challenge. Now, I think that when we talk about potential solutions, um, for the case of Georgia and countries in this situation, um, International incentives, stronger incentives from the EU and NATO should be very helpful because of the high popular support for joining those two institutions. And so figuring out how to make those incentives um, more efficient and more effective in this case. And particularly, it really depends on whether or not uh, leaders and parties and governments have other alternatives, such as turning to Russia, turning to China, uh, turning to Turkey, turning to other other sources of support. If the population is strongly in favor of joining uh, these Western institutions, though, that should help to to provide for um, this this contributing factor. When we talk about the problem of weak institutions and commitment to democratic norms um, in newer democracies like Georgia, one, it is just going to take time and effort and education. But institutional incentives, uh, changing institutions can help a lot. And as I said, when you have such a, an electoral system that can give such a disproportionate representation to one party, that's clearly something that should be changed. Now, of course, when that party is in power, it's very hard to change. But as I understand, there is this mediated agreement and so it should be changing for the 2024 election to a pure PR system, which should help to, to reduce that disproportionate characteristic of the system. Changing the campaign finance system should help. But also I would advocate for a stronger push from civil society, from non-political elites and from grassroots. We've seen such efforts make a big difference in other countries like the Philippines in, in 2010, uh, like South Korea in 2016, in grassroots protests plus united, you know, democratic, democratically committed um, party leaders from both parties uniting to impeach uh, a president, that, a prime minister that was, um, that was abusive of power. In Venezuela recently, that is not democratic, but is fighting an authoritarian government. The political parties are very fragmented, had a very hard time coming together and, and opposed over whether to um, work within the system and participate in very flawed elections or, or completely oppose and you know try to bring in international forces to overthrow the government. And so any dialogue between the political parties, internationally needed dialogue had failed multiple times. But finally, in the last year, civil society groups finally started to form and grow more autonomous, not be just dictated to by the political parties and actually achieved 
some uh, negotiated solutions to bring in opposition to the electoral um, council and, and changing electoral conditions. Um, and it's going to be a long-term effort. But civil society autonomous from political parties is another potential. And then finally, the thing that, that we usually uh, counsel is if you have one party that's hegemonic, and particularly if there's any kind of democratic erosion happening, the opposition must unite to provide a more balanced you know, choice, another poll. Now, in this case, as I understand it, there's some collusion between the two main parties to protect themselves at the top. But given that now we've had almost a decade of one party in power, my question is, is this, is this a possibility of opposition parties uniting? Because I see there are smaller parties that are there that are represented in the parliament and, um, and the main opposition party may be more willing to, to work with them to try to create these, um, these changes. So those are um, some of the, the things that I would suggest uh, that might be possibilities to consider. And finally, the last thing I want to say is there is the very dangerous or the risky possibility of a less than democratic, you know, radical or populist leader emerging when you have such dissatisfaction, such alienation from politics. If the population is rejecting both political parties, that's when we see a vacuum and, you know, a new uh, perhaps radical leader might emerge, but it also presents an opportunity for a more democratically committed, more unifying leader to emerge in this kind of situation. Yeah, thank you very much. So, yes, the political political environment is quite quite polarized, and from my perspective, from my memories, what I remember from the political life that. Uh, even though they always, in the 90s or 2000s, the political polarization was part of the political uh, culture and climate, there was a, uh, at least some, uh, at least in the behind the scene, there was a kind of discussion and the uh, stakeholders had, a, I mean, main stakeholders, main political actors had the ability to talk with each other, which is not the case now. And I think very much, and I hope very much that the initiatives coming from the European Union or coming from the uh, Georgian president uh, will somehow uh, will produce something, uh, at least uh, they calming down the situation and for the coming election that the, some mid ground, uh, middle ground parties will emerge and uh, uh, the, the, the diversify the political agenda as well. So this is what we could hope and of course the international organization could participate in this process, benefiting, proposing something and more motivating the political actors to be more, I'll say, more uh, pragmatic on that direction. So, um, uh, if uh, uh, there is no questions from the audience, for as uh, as I see so far, so maybe if you have some kind of uh, wish to to have some final remarks, uh, each of you, maybe we can have like two three minutes for each. Maybe Archie. Jennifer had a question to us, I guess. Um, yeah, I, don't know if you could... I think I had two questions to you. Okay, well, you want to reformulate <laughs> them quickly? Um, one is about the uh, collusion. Hmm. Uh, versus the potential for uh, the opposition parties and groups uniting. Um, and the second is, um, well, I wanted to make sure that that reform is supposed to go into place for a pure PR system. That was one thing, just clarifying in 2024, is that so far set? But I think another question is really about, could opposition, could, you know, is there enough of a civil society um, which might include intellectual figures, um, grassroots figures, NGOs, business, uh, religious groups that might form and be autonomous of the parties. Exactly. Maybe something like we have to uh, add to the discussion, the civil society, role of civil society, because they are also the political uh, stakeholders and they sometimes are involved in recruited war of one or another party or pushed by the one or another party to be the side, to take the side in the political polarization. Please, Tom. Well, I don't know who wants to go first. I, I can just make, say, a couple of remarks, but our, our children should definitely um, yeah. ad ad address this from Tbilisi. I mean, I think the, the issue of the opposition uniting 
the, the problem here is the very polarizing figure of Mikhail Saakashvili, leader of the former president, uh, leader of the UNM, now in jail, having come back to uh, Georgia and, and promptly been uh, arrested, as everyone knew he would, including himself. So he's now, as it were, um, put himself back in the center of Georgian politics by the process of, of being thrown in, in, into jail. And I think it's difficult for the opposition to kind of regroup um, while he is, um, you know, taking this this big stand. Um, and and you know, are they able to uh, to simultaneously kind of condemn his prosecution as politically motivated and say that they want to kind of form a new opposition without him? I, I think that's a quite a difficult challenge for uh, a lot of opposition. Um, uh, parties. Uh, I guess the second issue is about civil society, which indeed in 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 Georgia is strong. I'm personally, I think the the issue is again that it's it's rather limited to Tbilisi, maybe to the um, other couple of big cities, and doesn't sort of resonate with the um, with Georgia uh, as a whole. The kind of big rural population really doesn't have much contact with civil society. So here and there, of course, they're the ones who on election day can be mobilized or even bought with a few lorry, unfortunately, to go out uh, and vote. So that's, um, if, if Georgia was just the city of, of Tbilisi, then then sure, I think civil society could have a decisive role. But Georgia is, is of course, bigger than that. So that that's, as I see it, um, one big challenge there. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so, Arshu, please. Uh, I would agree that um, on one hand, the uh, civil society in Georgia is uh, quite strong, quite experienced, and uh, it has been uh, uh, active uh, and uh, quite uh, influential since uh, late 90s, uh, especially if compared to the uh, some uh, neighboring countries, uh, Georgia civil society is really vibrant uh, and uh, active. But uh, given this uh, very acute nature of uh, political polarization, this very fierce nature of political struggle, uh, which uh, polarizes everything, polarizes uh, media, and even civil society gets polarized uh, in relative terms, but still. And uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, total polarization of everything is something uh, which uh, has to be somehow overcome. But uh, the question is where to start from, starting from below, from civil society, trying to depolarize first um, in civil society, then go to media and then, uh, then they may take actions uh, uh, towards, uh, towards diffusing uh, tension in, in the any political uh, elite, or it should be a top-down process. Uh, Jennifer, you mentioned that uh, when there is a type of crisis, two types of uh, leaders may emerge. One type could be uh, a populist or a radical, and uh, maybe just on the contrary, uh, uh, somebody who will be who will have this. Uh, 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 con uh, convening power and uniting power to uh, unite, reconcile uh, the uh, society. So Madam President, as we as, as, as what mentioned, this was mentioned in uh, today, uh, has initiated this process and has an ambition to be that uh, kind of a leader. But uh, again, one needs to wait and see to what extent she is capable in the longer run to uh, support this uh, lead and support this uh, process. Uh, and uh, again, the process and the, the question of continuity, uh, what happens uh, after uh, her, I mean, after uh, in other next elections, if she's not uh, elected, for example, then uh, the new president will, will he or she, uh, she will continue this process of reconciliation or not. So that that's very important, this uh, leader, uh, the question of the leader. Uh, so these are uh, some open questions which remain over uh, about the civil society here. Uh, but the general trend is that uh, in certain areas, uh, uh, in certain areas, in certain subject areas, the civil society is quite quite strong and 
plays a very important uh, role, uh, including uh, I mean, watchdog role and uh, uh, and the policy uh, recommendations and uh, advice uh, has been provided to the government. But given this fierce nature of struggle, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, government and the uh, opposition uh, they they cannot be able uh, to hear th those messages and uh, take into account in their actions whatever is prompted or advised uh, from uh, civil society this is a vicious circle this this game in town is called i mean struggle for power and uh, and many many topical issues many outstanding issues uh, even of national security uh, are overlooked and uh, neglected in, in this situation. So, uh, given these circumstances, uh, it, it, would, it would be very, uh, it would be a real challenge for civil society to um, to uh, replenish itself, to, uh, uh, to to build its own uh, capacity on its own, uh, and to uh, try to change uh, the game, to be a, a game changer. Uh, again, it remains to be seen. As for uh, your other question about the collusion of the two parties, you may you answer, you, you ask, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, there is a uh, this battle, this struggle, which has been going on since uh, 2012, when uh, when UNM was outvoted and the Georgian Dream came to power. Since then, uh, we are observing uh, this confrontation, this standoff. Uh, but only in the, in the late years, this confrontation has become uh, fierce. And uh, as, as you, uh, as you um, use the term pernicious, so this adjective can, can be used uh, with, uh, with this term uh, only, uh, only since, I mean, over this past uh, two years, it became pernicious because it hurts uh, Georgia's national interests uh, and uh, it's, uh, it raises the costs uh, that uh, everybody uh, are paying uh, for, for this type of confrontation. Uh, but uh, they are engaged in this uh, struggle uh, and their, their primary goal is to stay, uh, the primary goal of the Georgian Dream is to stay in power uh, and uh, UNM's primary goal is to be uh, to claim always to claim uh, to form the next government to be the second to the leader and uh, and they want to see on the ring on the kind of a boxing ring only georgian dream as a as an adversary as a rival not anybody else even minor parties uh, although from time to time uh, unm calls for other minor parties to unite uh, reunite under uh, its own umbrella and uh, these calls uh, are repeatedly uh, heard, uh, but uh, in fact, uh, they feel quite uh, comfortable to be the only rival to a Georgian dream and to have only Georgian dream uh, as, a, as a potential uh, contester. Uh, and I think to a certain extent, the Georgian dream also feels uh, comfortable, although, although it is engaged in a very fierce confrontation with UNM, very experienced party because it was already in power, uh, but uh, still, uh, it, it is in Georgian tourism interest uh, the middle uh, the middle ground not to appear uh, on the scene. Uh, and in that sense, there is a certain kind of a collusion or uh, tacit agreement or whatever uh, un un unwritten kind of rules of, of the game which are there, which they are engaged in. So we have to. A society has to um, break uh, these circumstances. You asked about 2024. Are we moving towards that change? This is a very good question. This uh, uh, so-called Charmichel Agreement, among others, is about uh, uh, paving, further paving the way for minor political forces uh, to get into the parliament through, through lowering down the threshold for entering the parliament. But, uh, and this, was, this is a part of that agreement uh, but the Georgian Dream has withdrawn from that agreement, as I mentioned uh, in my uh, remarks. Uh, but, but, uh, mm, uh, but this does not mean that uh, this agreement is shelved uh, and nobody cares about this agreement. 
uh, because Georgia keeps moving forward uh, towards uh, um, implementation of uh, uh, obligations within association agreement. And uh, as of uh, this day, uh, there is an ongoing process of uh, finalizing uh, uh, the, the next uh, association agenda, 2021-2027. And uh, uh, unless uh, uh, Charles Michel's uh, uh, agreement uh, is uh, um, implemented uh, before 2024, then it definitely uh, will become a part of uh, this uh, uh, association, association agenda, uh, which uh, which is an official and uh, very serious uh, um, uh, obligation uh, of Georgia for a, for any government. And uh, if not uh, before 2024, then uh, after that, uh, the same Georgian dream or anybody else who will come to power will have to take into account uh, um, uh, these uh, obligations within this association agenda. Otherwise, Georgia will never get this promise of the EU membership and uh, and uh, I would uh, also expect that uh, this would uh, damage the prospect, hurt the prospects of Georgia to successfully submit application for EU membership in 2024. This is a very ambitious uh, goal, uh, but unless it is supported by actual reforms, then this goal is doomed to failure. And I think that uh, this is uh, understood within Georgian dream. So uh, being... Uh, more optimist rather than pessimist, I would expect that before 2024, we'll see some of the improvements uh, improvements uh, in the area of uh, electoral and uh, judicial reforms, and also also in terms of uh, reallocation of power within the parliament. Because another part of this uh, of the Sam Michel Michel's document is to uh, redistribute uh, power within the parliament uh, out of 16 uh, committees five committees uh, have to go to the opposition, which have not been fulfilled uh, yet. So uh, we still uh, have to wait and see to what extent um, these uh, commitments uh, will be fulfilled by Georgian Dream, although outside of the agreement, because as I said, Georgian Dream has already withdrawn from the, uh, from the uh, agreement, but it still has kind of moral obligation to move forward towards uh, deeper reforms uh, and regaining uh, this image of front runner in the Eastern Partnership region. Yes, I would add to so one additional financial instrument to which still uh, European Union and the United States has in order to motivate some additional changes. And especially I would underline here the investment plan proposed by the European Commission for the Eastern Partnership, which also has a conditionality, conditionality of uh, developing, uh, of, of continuing the rule of law and the democratic institution reform and so on. So I think it could also serve as an additional instrument um, uh, for, for incentives, I would say, for the government, for governing party in order to, to start changing the, the, the uh, atmosphere, let's say. And there is one question I would, uh, I will quote from the audience and I will ask it uh, and probably actually you can answer this question. Uh, question is about the is the radical changes of electoral system in Georgia possible? Uh, meaning that uh, the, the after all the question is meaning of shifting to the preferential system where the voter is voting not only they had the one choice but they also have a second choice which is usually good for the moderate uh, parties. So, Again, well, I don't have clear uh, answer to this question because uh, the reforms of the electoral system is still uh, uh, is still ongoing. And uh, mm, by the way, uh, among uh, among the topics which uh, Charles Michel's agreement uh, includes, uh, uh, electoral system is the area where there is a relatively more progress made, achieved, than in other areas. The least uh, progress was made if, uh, if progress can be, uh, uh, can be used as a, uh, as a word here uh, in, in, the in the reforms of the judicial sector. But uh, in terms of electoral system, process is moving on uh, and, uh, mm, and possibly, uh, possibly uh, this, uh, what, what the 
uh, author of this question means by radical change may take place within this uh, process. Uh, again, no less importantly would be lowering down the threshold from between natural and 2%. This would add uh, additional possibilities for uh, the minor parties to get into the parliament. By the way, uh, when, uh, when, when I think, Dimitri, you mentioned or, uh, yeah, you mentioned that uh, uh, that there is a very, you know, there is no, no breakthrough in the case of uh, middle ground in your question to Tom, you know, middle ground and uh, uh, there is not, not, nothing positive has changed uh, since uh, in the re recent, uh, uh, recent times. Uh, I would say that there is a one uh, one uh, change, uh, which may be a sign of uh, a positive trend, but uh, still uh, just a sign. This is a uh, fact that uh, uh, in this uh, uh, within, uh, as a result of the municipal, uh, municipal elections in 2021, in five electoral districts, opposition um, uh, had uh, an upper hand and we, I mean, uh, reached a, uh, attained, uh, gained the majority of the votes. Uh, in, in five, so it is in, uh, in Batumi, in Tallinn Jihra, and the, uh, other regions, which has not been case before. Uh, but uh, in, in case, uh, in case, we, in case the next ele next elections will be indeed proportional. Uh, and the threshold will be lowered down. And also, of course, if electoral system will be further fine-tuned and improved, then, uh, then the prospects for this, uh, mm, uh, for this change uh, will be more uh, realistic. Uh, thank you very much. I would add from my side that I was part of the discussion for the electoral system changes. And what we have now, that for sure, we'll have the next elections in 2024 will be proportional, which has a gives a more uh, uh, space for the smaller parties to, to gain the uh, gain the seats in the parliament. But there is a still question if the uh, political spectrum will agree on the decreasing the threshold in order to allow the more smaller parties to enter the parliament and to more diversify the political spectrum in the parliament. So this is where we are now and uh, uh, we have to finish our, uh, the, our time is um, uh, fast and so um, Thank you very much for all your contribution. Thank you for interesting presentation and great uh, analytical paper, which was uh, produced uh, uh, and presented in Georgian society. I think it's a good, um, good uh, roadmap or kind of good uh, uh, analytical, at least suggestion for the uh, organization institution who are now trying to de-escalate the situation in Georgia to use the chips and to maybe consider them as a practical, um, practical suggestion, practical recommendation. Thank you very much for your participation and thank you for uh, hosting us, uh, European uh, Cutting Europe. Thank you so much, Dimitri. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.